We are ready to start, and I think that I'm ready to start with all of these borrowed glasses, so uh, bear with me. I'm Valerie Lee, Vice Provost of Diversity and Inclusion, Vice President of Outreach and Engagement, and the Chief Diversity Officer at the Ohio State University. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion, ODI, is an academic support unit devoted to inclusive excellence. Our scholarships, pipeline, and pathway programs are nationally renowned and among the oldest in the nation. We are particularly proud to be the home of three centers, the Latina and Latin American Space for Enrichment and Research, or LASA as we call it, the Frank W. Hale Jr. Black Cultural Center, and of course, the Todd Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male. At President Michael Drake's investiture service, on Tuesday afternoon, he mentioned several ODI programs as exemplars of our land-grant mission, most notably the Bell National Resource Center. We were delighted to hear the president of the Ohio State University affirm a commitment to access and affordability, community engagement, and excellence through diversity. This is why you are here this morning participating in an event whose proceeds are targeted to advancing the success of African American males. Our former iconic leader, Dr. Frank W. Hale Jr., was fond of saying commitment without cash is counterfeit. Your presence here testifies to your commitment and we appreciate the giving of your time talent and treasure to the Todd Bell Lecture Series Breakfast. Thank you so very much. It, yes, you can clap. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction. Gene Smith is in his 10th year as Director of Athletics at The Ohio State University. He's widely recognized among the leaders of his profession and has been named one of the most powerful people in collegiate sports. Smith was named the Buckeyes Director of Athletics March 5, 2005, and was elevated to Vice President and Director of Athletics in January of 2014. He previously served as Director of Athletics at Arizona State, Iowa State, and Eastern Michigan Universities, and is entering his 30th year in the role. At Ohio State, Smith oversees the nation's most comprehensive and one of its most successful collegiate athletics programs. The department sponsors 36 fully funded varsity sports with more than 1,000 student athletes regularly competing for Big Ten Conference and NCAA championships. And of course, we recently have won national championships in pistol, wrestling, synchronized swimming, and football. Now, as someone who attended both our playoff game against Alabama and the national championship game against Oregon, I am really proud of Smith's leadership. Under his leadership, the Ohio State Athletics Department has thrived, winning many conference and national individual and team athletic championships and awards. As expressed in a recent Columbus Dispatch editorial, Gene Smith might be running short of trophy cases. Smith is active in the Columbus community. He is a member of the Columbus Sports Commission, the boards of the YMCA of Central Ohio, and the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Columbus, and the governing board of trustees of the Lincoln Theater Association. He serves on the Kids Unlimited National Advisory Board, an organization committed to positively transforming the lives of inner city children growing up in Toledo, Ohio. In addition, Smith and his wife, Sheila, support numerous community charities. On campus, 
Smith is active with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion's Todd Bell National Resource Center on the African American male. We are very appreciative of his support. He's someone who always speaks when he sees you. He always waves. He is someone who recognizes the champion in all of us. Vice President and Director of Athletics, Gene Smith. Thank you, Valerie, for the kind introduction. How's everybody this morning? Are you guys awake or not? How many were at the Stevie Wonder, Wonder concert last night? Yeah, I think I'm still there. That brother can roll, I'm telling you. But uh, let me uh, thank all of you for uh, being here this morning. I appreciate, Valerie, the kind introduction. I thought they gave you the short bio. Uh, but uh, this is a... Uh, <laughs> this is a, a blessing to, to have an opportunity to pause and, and contribute uh, to an unbelievable mission, uh, the Todd Anthony Bell Resource Center. And I thought I'd just tell you a quick personal story uh, of why I'm so engaged and my wife, Sheila, is so engaged. Um, when I came here in 2005 and had the opportunity to get to know Max Stewart, uh, I wanted to make sure that I had the opportunity to assist uh, at that point in time, Minority Affairs and, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion with a particular emphasis on making sure that our young African-American males uh, had an environment uh, where they could be successful. And I, I personally experienced some of the challenges uh, that many of our African-American males used to experience prior to all of the programs uh, that have been developed here with the great leadership in, in this office. Uh, I was a, st a student. Uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, in the ninth, ninth grade. And my father uh, made a decision that I was no longer going to go to public schools. Uh, had I continued on to the public schools, I would have gone to John F. Kennedy. Anybody here from Cleveland? Okay, so you guys know where JFK is, right? So I lived right behind the school, so it was a natural progression in life to go to JFK with me and my boys. But he uh, sat me down and told me that I was not going to go to John F. Kennedy. I'm gonna go, I was going to go to Chanel High School out in Bedford. So I bust out to Chanel High School, which was all white. There were three African-American males there. And what really pissed me off, it was all boys. <laughs> and that was a traumatic experience in my life. I'm still going through counseling. <laughs> but the reality of my challenge in my first year is representative of what some of the young African-American males experienced when they came to The Ohio State University. Many of them had gone to all black schools all their lives. And then they come into our environment and in many cases find that they were the only person of color in their classroom. And people sometimes don't understand what that means, let alone some of the topics or issues that arise in that classroom when you feel like everybody's looking at you because you should have the answer. It's just a fact that you walk into that room and you're the only one. That is a traumatic experience that most people don't understand. I wanted to make sure that those people who are in leadership positions like me that look like them provided inspiration, motivation, and aspiration for those young people. So I want to congratulate the Todd Bell Anthony Resource Center leadership because I know our retention rate has gone from in the low 30s to north of 90 percent. So congratulations. I want to introduce our first speaker, and um, uh, Dr. James Moore is, is uh, a direct a reason for a lot of the great accomplishments here. Let's first of all, let's also give a round of applause for the young men who were uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming us as we came in. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. James Moore was uh, appointed the Distinguished Professor of Urban Education at The Ohio State University in 2013. He is one of four appointed distinguished professors in the College of Education and Human Ecology 
and is the director of the Todd Bell Anthony National Resource Center on the African American Male. He also holds a faculty affiliation with the Curran Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, Ohio Collaborative, Criminal Justice Research, and the John Glenn Institute at The Ohio State University. Additionally, he is an Associate Provost in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Dr. Moore is an expert in the opportunity gap that the black male's academic achievement uh, needs to advocate for, for advancing young boys and men of color in the success rate in education. He has recently authored the book, Multicultural Counseling for Diverse, Diverse Gifted Learners, a Guide for Practice. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Moore to come up, and as he's coming up, I want to thank him uh, for his great work. Uh, he's an outstanding, passionate leader and does a marvelous job. Dr. James Moore. Good morning. I'm, in, I'm so excited to be here. This gives us an opportunity to put our young men on the stage as we oftentimes when we look in the newspaper, the newspaper does not reflect and depict the excellence that it represents in this room. Um, I, we have achieved so much, but you can never achieve what you want to achieve without a good team. And I like to think we had an outstanding team when we won the national championship. And we believe, we're still striving to win the national championship that we have 100% of our young men who graduate not only graduate, but go forth and pay it forth in their respective communities. I, I would be remiss, I want to highlight, but you, as I said, you can never do anything without the team. I just want the staff of the Bell National Resource Center to stand up really quickly so we can recognize them, because these, are the, these individuals are the heart and soul of the work that we do. When I took the position, I said, we have to be about development, regardless of how the young man may come in our office, it is our job to help develop them to the highest level. And we start with our own, and I want to celebrate, I want you to help me celebrate. Uh, Todd Suttiff, at the beginning of the year, he was Todd Suttiff. As a, as a result of February, in February, he's now Dr. Todd Suttiff. Not only that, everyone in our office, not that you have to have a doctor to be someone. My mom would say I was someone without it. But nevertheless, we're now, every time you see Ty Cornute, you say, when are you going to get your doctorate? Because everybody has one. <laughs> nevertheless, just want to highlight some things that we, I like to believe, uh, we're the premier institution as it relates to working with young black males. This year, we have a total, a total, number of, a, a total number of African American males with a cumulative 3.0 GPA or higher, we have 474 African American males. And I don't think you all know how significant this is. <laughs> I would argue there is not a university in the entire United States, even Harvard. They don't bring enough brothers in <laughs> to count it. That is, uh, when, I f when I first became the director, we had about 200 and something. So it just shows, it's not about me, it's about this community and the community and the spirit of, of Ohio State and how they uh, support this effort. This year, those, our signature program is the early arrival program. Uh, and usually a third of our young men who matriculate at Ohio State participate in this program. They come three days before the school year started. And the individuals who participate in this program, the retention rate is one of the highest on this campus. It's 95%. And so all of these efforts are due to, um, the, uh, due to the staff and the commitment and the long hours. I've never heard the staff ever tell me that I work more than 40 hours. When you do this kind of work, you gotta be prepared to work an extra 20 or 30 hours because you're so committed to it. Uh, this year, uh, because I wanna be sensitive to time, um, we give out a national award uh, each and every year recognizing someone who does outstanding work around African-American males. 
in honor of our founder, Dr. Mack A. Stewart, who was at that time the Vice Provost of Office of Minority Affairs. This year's recipient, if you look in your book, but he's not here, but he'll be coming back for an event in September, uh, is Mr. Corey Anderson. He's a senior vice president at, um, at the Rockefeller Foundation in Arkansas. And he single-handedly has just galvanized and built coalitions to improve education outcomes for black males at every level of the educational continuum. So I, I, I would be remiss, but I have much more to talk about, but I wanna leave this time for the stars of the show who are exemplars of the work that we do. And, and these students, Lenard Tuff II and Alfonso Gillette the fourth. We have a lot of thirds and fourths around here. You can see their fathers feel really good about, their grandfathers feel really good about naming them out of them. So they are nice uh, examples, but I would be remiss if I didn't say it. We give out a war each and every year because uh, we uh, call the Gene and Sheila Smith Excalibur Prize. We believe we're gonna produce a Rhodes Scholar one day, and each and every year we're working hard to do that, and I think at Ohio State we've only had three Rhodes Scholars in the history of this institution, and we believe we're gonna do it. But this year, recipient of the Gene uh, and Sheila Smith Excalibur Prize is Leonard Tufts II. And this, you have to be among the best to get this award, uh, the staff select, this, select the recipient. It's about scholarship, it's about service, it's about leadership, and most importantly, it's about character. And this year's recipient is Leonard uh, Tufts II, and he'll come and give a few remarks, as well as Alfonso the fourth. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out this morning. Hope you have uh, been enjoying the breakfast and uh, congratulations once again to Leonard on his um, recognition that he's received. Um, so, Leonard, what's one of your fondest memories about the uh, BNRC? Oh, I bet you I got a better one. <laughs> <laughs> he's always trying to start his competition. Uh, well, who do you want to go first? You want to rock, paper, scissors nah, for it? What, 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 let's go then. <laughs> all right, let's see. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Ha. Best two out of three. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, so I, I think one of the fondest mem uh, memories that I have of the BRC, uh, one of which is, you know, talking to Dr. Moore about his illustrious uh, football career that nobody's ever seen the highlight reel for. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're still waiting on that one. Uh, but I think one of the fondest memories that I've had during my time here uh, would have to be getting the opportunity to travel to the Virgin Islands for um, the International Colloquium on Black Males in Education. This was actually my first time, my first abroad, study abroad experience at Ohio State, and that would not have been possible uh, without the help of the BNRC. Uh, during this experience, I not only got to experience the culture of the Virgin Islands, the rich history, uh, how I relate to it um, as a black male in America, but I also had the uh, unique opportunity to be, uh, be in a room surrounding myself with many black PhD um, holders. And for me, that had always been an aspiration of mine. Um, but it wasn't until that moment that I was around in a room surrounded by all these brilliant minds that that became a tangible um, reality for me, something I, I could actually achieve. So I'm, I'm very thankful um, for all the opportunities that um, the BNRC has presented to me. Um, I've, it's been a great time here. And I really hope to uh, see what impact they have on students uh, of the future. So how about yours? <laughs> As always, a tough act to follow, but um, <laughs> funny memories coming up. But uh, well, the BNRC has their early arrival program where they're invited us here um, to Ohio State for black male freshmen about three days early. And I remember coming here. I only did the program just because they said you can move in early. So I was just ready to get away from home and get on campus. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to uh, be doing a, so much educational things within those three days, though. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it, it was a great experience. But <laughs> one of the things I didn't know was coming in, I know we had the leadership of Todd Sutter and Todd Cornute and the Todd Anthony Bell Resource Center. I was like, wait, so who is Todd? Which Todd is which? Who was the center named after? So that was one thing I feel like a lot of students from the EAP can relate to, is trying to distinguish between who's Todd Sutterfin, who's Ty, who's, who's ahead of what. <laughs> but um, 
one of my most recent fondest memories that I've been reflecting on since I'm now a senior here and I'm graduating in May has been the time that I've worked as a work-study student in the BNRC. So that experience came about one day just because I came, uh, they do uh, just semester check-ins with the students in my freshman year. I know I was really having a tough time just getting acclimated into campus and just managing my time and just know, knowing all the resources that I had available. And then I kind of came to them in desperation. I was kind of running low on money and I didn't even know that I had like uh, a work study fund available until uh, Mr. Sutter sat down with me and just told me that like, hey, I mean, you don't have to be struggling like this. You can come in here, um, we can work around your interests and you can work for the BNRC. And through that uh, position, it hasn't only been just a job, but it's also allowed me to receive great mentorship from the leadership, um, Dr. Bennett, uh, Dr. Suttoff, and Dr. Moore within the office and just build great relationships. And now I get to be here um, at events like this and just get to share my story. So I wanna um, thank you all for coming out this morning. Yeah, uh, Lenore. Yeah, so with these two stories, these are just two small examples of many uh, some of the experience that students uh, have here at the BNRC. So I hope that you all continue to support the Bell World Resource Center because you're supporting students like us. So thank you all for coming out tonight and I hope you enjoy the program. Good job, guys. You're obviously of a different age because Lenard thinks it's nighttime. You know, for those of us who went to the Stevie Wonder concert, we know it's not nighttime. <laughs> We're still struggling. You know, but again, let me uh, uh, thank both of them for uh, sharing uh, some of their fond memories and, and congratulate them on, on their accomplishments. Uh, they are definitely exemplars of, of the Bell uh, Resource Center. So congratulations, guys, and thank you. Um, I'm not going to read Alex's bio. You know, we a significant majority of uh, people in this room know Alex Shoemake, and I personally want to thank him for uh, taking time out of his schedule to come here and be a part of this program and, and help share his message and, and be an inspiration for the young men that we serve. Um, I want to really share a message with the young men in the room in particular, uh, and the young women, but the young men who are part of the National Resource Center um, the reality is, as you guys read this bio, uh, you do not achieve the level of success and the accomplishments and have the opportunity to serve on the numerous boards that are listed here unless you come into the world, come out of your experiences with a great foundation. So as you leave the Ohio State University, understand that the things that you've learned here <clears throat> are very important in the classroom. But the most important thing is your character. When I think of integrity, the highest of values, uh, right by family, when you think of integrity, you want to think of a person who exudes integrity, who is integrity. You hear people say they have integrity on their sleeve. So if someone was to ask me today and they interviewed me on whatever, help us understand what integrity is, I'd hold up this picture. Alex Shumay is integrity. He is trusted. He is a thought leader. He has always been committed to diversity, as, a, as you can read in his bio. He's a leader, an effective leader, because of that integrity. You don't achieve these things without the other values of great work ethic, commitment, and dedication. And today is an example of that, because he was with me last night at Stevie Wonder, and here he is this morning. <laughs> so I want to thank him for what he's getting ready to share with us, but I young, want our young men in particular to pause and make, make sure, and some of you in Team Smith have heard him speak before, make sure you pay attention to this man that's coming before you today. Because in the reality, besides this bio, the most important thing you gotta get from here, from him, is his integrity. My friend Alex Shumay. Oh, and by the way, he's a great husband, he's a great father, he's a great grandfather, got a little tennis game in him, okay? And he's a member of our esteemed book club. 
where our last book was on Pilates, wasn't it? Yeah. So, but anyway, my good friend Alex Shoemate. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Good to be here this morning. Let me thank Gene for your very kind and, and generous uh, introduction. But it's truly a privilege, truly a pleasure of mine to be here on this 10th anniversary. Let's applaud that. It's good to see so many friends and leaders of our great community who are here this morning. And thank you for all that you do to support Columbus, support The Ohio State University, and to support important programs like the Bell National Resource Center. Uh, before I share a few thoughts, I would like to introduce to some of you and present to others, my wife, Renee, if you could stand up and be recognized. Thank Renee for all of her support, encouragement, and indeed her love. As I was thinking about this morning and what I might share that would be meaningful and hopefully inspirational to those of us who assembled early after a great concert last night. I thought about a story that former Ohio Governor Richard Celeste told me about one of his experiences when he was the director of the Peace Corps. Celeste had traveled to a tiny remote village called Ancora to visit one of his Peace Corps volunteers named Helen de Robriet. As a volunteer in Ancora for nearly 10 years, de Robrier had taught the villagers farming techniques that had quadrupled their crops. She taught them simple yet critical personal health care habits, such as boiling their drinking water in order to extend their lives. As Celeste arrived in Ancora, Helen de Robrier walked out of her pint-sized hut, surrounded by happy, healthy children who were clearly crazy about her. Celeste and de Robrier traveled throughout the village and toured the village together, and she introduced him to many Ancorans. With every introduction, the villagers touched Celeste's face and then sniffed his shirt. Celeste found that behavior somewhat odd, but assumed that it was merely a local custom, even though he had never encountered such customs like that in Africa before. At a small ceremony that followed the tour, Celeste presented de Robrier with a letter from President Carter that explained that the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers was coming to Ancora to construct an irrigation system, a plea that de Robrier had been making for many, many years. As she read the letter, she held it so close to her face that it brushed against her cheek as she slowly moved one squinted eye across each line on the page like this. So let's watch with intrigue. And after the ceremony concluded, he pulled Helen aside and asked, why did you read the president's letter that way? She said, oh, I thought you knew. I'm blind. Blind, he said? How can you be blind? Well, I've been since birth, she answered. I can see shadows and outlines with my left eye and barely make out the letters on a page, but legally, I'm blind. Celeste asked, how did you give me the tour? That's easy, she said. I know every inch of the village by touch, by sound, and by smell. He asked again, 
how could you name every person you introduced me to? She said, I know them by their voice. I know each person by their laugh. Everyone has their own smell, their own feel, even you. Amazed, he asked, didn't they resist a blind woman teaching them to farm? Oh, she said, they don't know I'm blind. You see, there's never been a blind person in Encora. They have no concept of blind, no word for it. They only understand that I see things in a different way. And so they try to see things the way that I do. Celeste began to understand. Oh, so that's why they touch my face and sniff my shirt when we met. Yes, she, she said. And in Gora, they say I give them the gift of fresh eyes. They were looking at you through fresh eyes. Governor Celeste was astonished by de Robier and how she helped people open their minds and their hearts to see the world in a different way through her gift of fresh eyes. But there was still one thing he couldn't quite figure out and finally had to ask as he headed out of that tiny African village. Helen, he asked, what do they think when you read with your face so close to the page? Helen responded, Director Celeste, before I got here, no one could read. No one had ever read anything. So I set up classes and taught the whole village. And now, even though I explained they don't have to read the way I do, the entire population of Angkora reads like this. You can tell I love this story of Helen de Robrier. It reminds me that we all have the ability to tap into the power of seeing things in a whole new way, of using the gift of fresh eyes. Last week when I toured the Bell Center in its new location, at least a new location to me since they've moved, one of the things that I was reminded of was the vision, the goals, the objectives of Todd Bell. When he returned to the university and began to work at the Black Male Center, as it was called then, and his goal was to be a person to help young African-American males learn to succeed. And I thought about the programs that I was being talked with about, how those programs, and you've heard Dr. Moore talk about the outstanding programs that we have at our great university. One of the things that I realized that during these 10 years, since Todd was named the first person to lead the initiative, during this decade, the staff, the leadership, the volunteers of the Bell Center have been applying the gift of fresh eyes as they seek to help and assist our young African-American males. Think about the first days on campus when new students are filled with excitement but also filled with fear. Glad to be leaving home and yet anxious about being on their own as we heard the two students talk about. When they first get here at this big, vast university, the largest single campus in the United States, students are wide-eyed walking into convocation. Imagine seeing 7,000 classmates or walking into their dorm room facing a couple of strangers that they're now going to call roommates. They ask themselves, how will I make friends? How will I locate my classes? How will I talk to a professor? How will I find a good place to study? They have lots of questions. But thank goodness, at our university, there are programs, and more importantly, 
there are people in place to help new students. And as we heard this morning, one of the most effective programs for African-American males is the Bell Center's Early Arrival Program. As we heard, those three days, those few days spent together in this program sets a foundation for a successful journey through the Ohio State University. It makes this big university small. It allows each participant to see the university in a new, supportive, empowering way. Through the eyes of others who are succeeding, they begin to see their own path to success. An example of using the gift of fresh eyes to make a dream, to make an idea, to make a program even better. Last fall, the New York Times, in its November 9th, 2014 edition, praised the Bell Center's efforts on behalf of African American males. Again, as we heard this morning, at Ohio State, the graduation rate for black male undergraduates has risen some 30 percentage points over the last decade. We're leading the nation. That deserves some applause. <laughs> Connecting students with mentors and advisors, classmates and friends, giving them skills and confidence has greatly enhanced their chances for success. For that, the Bell Center deserves our gratitude and our support. And I want to personally thank you for what you've already done to support the Bell Center in its first 10 years and encourage you to keep on investing financially in this powerful resource. And as we say in the Baptist Church, you don't have to just invent, invest with your treasure, but your time and your talent as well. Be the person that connects African-American male students. Empower these young men to succeed. You need to be neither African-American nor a male to do that. We all have a part in this endeavor. Allow someone the opportunity to see through your fresh eyes the world, your view, and help them expand their vision of what they can become. If your office is having a reception, invite some students to attend. At community events like this, ask a few students to sit at your company table. Give them a chance to look at the business community as well as the nonprofit community through fresh eyes. By providing students with opportunity to observe others, we teach them how to navigate the world and make an impact. The gift of fresh eyes also comes from those we seek to help, seek to advance, and seek to support. The motto of our great university is education for citizenship which means that with an Ohio State diploma comes the responsibility to do good for others, to be a difference as well as make a difference. The Bell Center has a group of mentoring relationships with seventh graders. One of the schools is the Columbus City Preparatory School for Boys. Undergraduates make weekly visits with the boys over lunch they have workshops, field trips, and conversations. They mentor, encourage academic excellence, and positive self-esteem. With so many negative messages in the popular culture and in the news, these face-to-face -face interactions are vitally important for our African-American men and to those who mentor them. With many of my good friends like Akko Kamban, who's here this morning, I've had the opportunity to participate in community mentoring breakfasts. One of the programs that we worked together on several years ago was a program that on Saturday mornings, we would 
invite young high school students to come to a free breakfast and we'd have lots of good food and good participation. I remember one Saturday morning there was one of our community leaders who was waxing eloquent about the importance of studying to achieve success. After the breakfast, I was driving one of the young men home and we were talking about the speaker and I asked him what he thought. And he paused for a moment and then he turned to me and he said, Mr. Shoemate, I like the speaker, but how do you study? I almost stopped the car in the middle of the street. And I got the gift of fresh eyes from that young man because I was reminded that we just can't tell someone what to do or why to do it, but like the Bell Center, we need to teach, we need to coach, we need to give them the skills they need, and we need to show them how. It's an incumbent upon all of us who have been successful. And as I look around the room, the room is filled today with very successful people. All of us need to help others. On a recent talk show, the actor Kevin Spacey talked about the moral obligation that people who have realized success, like those of us in the room, we have a moral obligation to provide young people with opportunities and role modeling. Borrowing from his mentor, Spacey coined the phrase, send the elevator back down and bring up others. Send the elevator back down and bring up others. As I was thinking about that quote from Spacey, and also thinking about the question that young man asked me about how do you study, I think it's more accurate to phrase our more moral obligation as taking the elevator back down and bringing others up with us. Because in taking the elevator back down, we're there with them, like the Bell Center to give them the gift of fresh eyes through coaching them, teaching them, listening to them, and helping them. Another example very quickly of the Bell Center is the Fellows Program, which adds African-American PhDs to the higher education pipeline. It's preparing our bachelor's graduates for more than a degree, but for a life, making sure that they take the elevator down and bring up more and more people whose abilities and accomplishments will change the quality of all of our lives. As a university, we hope that students become lifelong learners. So should we be lifelong learners. Learning, in fact, is the gift of fresh eyes because it gives us fresh perspectives. Teachers are found not only in our schools, but our communities, our businesses, our churches, and our families. They are found amongst the leaders and participants in many programs and initiatives here at the nationally recognized Bell Center. By contributing to the Bell Center and its programs, you help ensure that it can continue to empower even more young men. When we take the elevator back down, we learn, we lend a helping hand, and more importantly, we fill that elevator not only with dreams, but real opportunities. So this morning, we pay tribute to Todd Bell, who returned to his alma mater and modeled what it means to be a student athlete at The Ohio State University. But we also celebrate the fresh eyes that the leadership and volunteers of the Bell Center have applied during the past 10 years. 
Again, thank all of you for being here this morning and supporting this great organization. I encourage you to continue to support the Bell Center with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Continue to be innovative and apply the principles of fresh eyes. And yes, take the elevator back down and bring others up with you. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Alex. That was impressive, unbelievable. Hopefully, uh, uh, particularly our, our, our students uh, uh, take a great deal from that message. So thank you so much for your time. You know, normally when you have a keynote speaker, you, you have a gift and you actually ask them to come back up and you give them a gift. But I know Alex so well that I have to give him his gift at my crib. Because <laughs> it's in one of those things called a uh, you know, wine fridge. So he'll, he'll just go pick one out. So anyway, thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, Renee, for, for your kind words. And, you know, I had a flashback, too, because when you uh, went back and you talked about how it used to be called the Black Center here, I had a flashback at Notre Dame. You know, they, they called it the Black Center there. And, and I remember the great programs that we had to get through. It was called Bid Wiss. And uh, it was a heck of a program, heck of a program. But anyway, uh, <laughs> You know, I want to uh, take my, my last opportunity to, uh, to, to thank all of you for being here. I, I want to thank our sponsors uh, who are up, listed up here today, uh, AEP Ohio, Fifth Third Bank, Honda, Radio One, and, and our overall sponsor, Motorist Insurance. Uh, I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank all of you for coming and, and ask uh, that as you uh, receive invitations for next year, whatever time, wherever place uh, this event is held next year, uh, please uh, help drive it, help do everything you can to get others to participate. This is a fundraiser uh, for the Todd Bell Anthony Resource Center, and I want to do everything that we can to help uh, that center uh, be more successful. I want to recognize the family, the Todd Bell family's here, table six. Uh, Mom, you're there? Where she, where, there she is. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And my last duty is to, to ask a couple people to come up, uh, Ralph Smithers uh, from, from Motorist and uh, Bob Bueller, if you can come up. Uh, we have uh, one of our corporate sponsors and one of our donors. Uh, we'd like both of them to come up and share a few words before we close out the, the morning. So come on up, guys. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Moore and uh, Ty Cornute asked me if I would say a few words about uh, how we became involved with the Bell Center and um, I also want to make, I think more importantly, why do we stay involved. Um, my wife Beth, also sitting over here at the table, and I um, raised our children in St. Louis. And um, our children, Natalie and Sam, attended a, a very nice school in suburban West County. And uh, in sixth grade, our son Samuel started playing football. And um, in his football experience, the, there was a team of about 55 boys, and there were 40 of them from Parkway West, the suburban school that they attended. And they were mostly white, all from the suburbs, and mostly reasonably wealthy. And similar to uh, Dr. Gene Smith's experience, there were about 15 boys who were uh, bussed out to the, our local school who played on Sammy's football team and from sixth grade to through their senior year we got to know these boys the boys from the city were all black they were all from the city and they were all poor and um, through that experience we were able to see that at first what was most obvious were the differences between these boys the color of their skin, the background that they came from, but as we got to know them, what was more important was despite the different challenges and the different experiences that they had, their aspirations were the same. 
and they were all created in God's image. One of the things that occurred in the football experience was that there was a, there was a time period between when school was over and practice started. And the boys from the suburbs would go home between practice, but the boys from the city were bused 25 miles from their home so they couldn't return home. So one of the things that we did was uh, we would invite them to our home and they would come back uh, to our home between school and practice and uh, they would eat a lot they would study and they would goof around um, prior to practice. And this really provided a window into a world that I would say Beth and I knew about, but it wasn't personal and it became personal. Over the course of those seven years, we came to not only know these boys, we loved these boys. After they graduated from high school, uh, we knew that that chapter ended, but we didn't want that experience to end because now it had become so personal. Through a set of interesting uh, coincidences and experience, we became connected with the Todd Bell Center here at, at Ohio State. A friend of mine, as I was describing this to him, it was Sean Kinley who painted the, the picture of Todd Bell that hangs in the center, described these not as coincidences, but as God incidents. And I think Beth and I would certainly agree that that was, uh, that was certainly the case. I think the, that's really how we became involved and how we got connected to the Bell Center. What's more important for us, I think, and I, I think it's probably been five years since we've been involved with the Bell Center, what's more important is why do we stay involved? And if you get a chance to look at the painting, uh, you'll see sprinkled throughout that painting several passages that are important to uh, people that were involved in the painting. And there's one, it's a, it's a, I think it's a neat painting, and there's Todd Bell holding a football, and just to the right of the football, there is a passage that was selected by Ty Cornute that I think describes why we stay involved with the Bell Center. The passage is from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, and it is, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. That is what the Todd Bell Center does. It sharpens men. Um, and that is why we stay involved. The Bell Center teaches young men how to succeed in an academic setting and then beyond that. And they're, as, as highlighted by the statistics that were shared earlier, they're extremely successful. And it sounds like we probably won another national championship that nobody's talking about. And that's the graduation rate. So um, great work to the, to the people that are involved in that. About a year ago, Dr. Moore asked me if I would meet with one of the students from the Bell Center and talk to him about uh, potential career choices. As I was heading to the meeting, Beth asked me, um, what do you know about the student? And I said, well, individually, I don't know anything about him, but I know he's a Bell Center. I know he's a student of the Bell Center. I know he spent time with Dr. Moore and Ty Cornute and Robert Bennett and Todd Suddeth. So here's what I know about him. He'll be on time. When I meet with him, he will be extremely well prepared. He will operate in a professional manner, and I know that I will learn more from him than he will learn from me. And that is what the experience that I had with that individual and with the other individuals that I've had the honor to meet with on the staff and the students that they serve. So for the students here, take advantage of the time, and uh, maybe you'll be up front like Alfonso and Leonard were, um, but you have a great gift here in front of you uh, with the great talents of, of Dr. Moore, uh, Robert, Todd, and Ty. Get to know them. Iron sharpens iron. It won't always be easy, but they will teach you what you need to know to succeed here at Ohio State and beyond. Thank you. Uh, good morning. There's more people here than I thought from sitting up here. But uh, my name is Ralph Smithers, Jr., and uh, Ty Cornute asked me to give a few reflections about uh, what the Todd Bell Center means to me, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, I work for Motorist Insurance. I mentioned that um, earlier, and my colleagues from Motorist are here, and I'd like them to uh, stand and be recognized. 
Um, just a few little notes about our company. I mean, we presume that you know us because that's our logo, but just in case you don't, uh, we're, we're headquartered here in Columbus. We're right across the street from the Art Museum. Uh, we write all kinds of insurance, not just auto insurance, um, in 26 states. Right, Ann? <laughs> 26 states. And um, we've been in Columbus since 1928, so I like to mention that because there's a, a really big, uh, when we talk about personally and professionally, I work for a hometown company who I believe loves Ohio State as much as I do. Have you ever been downtown on a Friday before a football game and noticed that there's a Block O flag 21 stories up? And I believe uh, that that's got to be the highest displayed Block O flag in the world, given that. So uh, personally and professionally, there, there's such a good fit um, with, with motorists. And I'd like to acknowledge Ann King, who's our um, Chief Human Resources Officer, and also uh, Dave Kaufman, who's our President and CEO. He couldn't be here today. He wanted to be here. And we got an email from him very late last night. He was trapped in New Hampshire, had some plane issue, so he couldn't, couldn't make it. But I wanted to uh, thank all of them um, and our rest of our executive team for their sincere commitment uh, to diversity and also their sincere commitment to the Todd Bell Center. And I'm going to share with you a few things about me personally that they didn't know before they uh, made, made this investment. So that just makes me even, uh, even more thankful. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, little history. Um, my parents met at Ohio State as freshmen, in freshman orientation, and I didn't get to confirm this, but I believe the year was 1959. Uh, they both graduated. They had three kids. All three of us graduated from Ohio State and um, also have a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles, so when they say Buckeye born, Buckeye bread, what's the rest of that? Buckeye till I'm dead? I thought you all knew that. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that really means, that, that truly means something to me. And, you know, it meant something to me, you know, even as a little kid. But there's even more to it than that, and I want, that's what I really wanted to talk about. Um, when I was making the transition from uh, high school to college, I had a chance to apply and interview and uh, receive um, a scholarship called the Minority Scholars Program Scholarship. Uh, it was offered by what was then called the Office of Minority Affairs. And um, at that time, it was a $1,000 scholarship that actually covered two-thirds of in-state tuition. Can you believe that? <laughs> I tell people that, and they look at me like, you must really be old. So, um, you know, long and short, um, it was not only a scholarship, but there were a lot of opportunities to interact with um, other people in the program to provide uh, the same kind of support that the Todd Bell Center provides that has uh, led to, to lifelong uh, friendships. And eventually, uh, as when I was still part of the program, they ended up raising the scholarship to full in-state tuition. So I consider that one of the great, great blessings in my life. I am so thankful for that every single day. And I've been out in the workforce, I was 26 years ago, and I still think about it every day. And just kind of tying it back, um, just being able to receive, you know, one of the great, great blessings in my life. I've always tried to find ways to pay Forward, you know, whether it be in service and, and, and more recently financially. And I wanted to share with you uh, one of the ways that uh, we're doing that, if, if it's okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Brian Drury, who is the uh, founder of the Bucking the Trend Scholarship. Uh, he asked uh, me, and I see uh, my friend Raymond out there. Where's Ray? There he is. I saw you out there. Um, and there's some others, and I don't know if any of the others are here or not, but. Uh, Brian founded a small scholarship, asked me to be a partner, and uh, it's just a bunch of guys who uh, pool their resources together. And uh, we've given out about $10,000 worth of scholarships, uh, 10 $1,000 scholarships. Uh, this past January, we gave out three $1,000 scholarships, and it's literally just a couple of uh, 
people who are just trying to pool their resources together to try to pay forward, to try to repay the gifts that, that we were, were given. And um, I wanted to mention that because we want to we want to do better than that. So if uh, you would be interested in learning more about that, please uh, see us after the program. But the key is, you know, it's not only about supporting diversity, which kind of comes back to the professional, because I work in human resources. It's not all about helping uh, further diversity, but it's also about giving people a chance. And we have a chance through our scholarship to look at resumes, and I actually intercepted one of them to try to hire the kid, and he was already taken. I mean, they are super talented. And uh, we just would like you to, you know, make sure that you know that there will be a return on your investment if you invest in the Todd Bell Center. Uh, there are just amazingly uh, talented, uh, outgoing uh, young men, and I know also young women, uh, throughout the, the university that can make a big difference for you uh, in your workplace. So um, Todd, the Todd Bell Center means the world to me. It's a, just a really wonderful way to pay forward. It's a wonderful way for me to pay a, you know, they, they thank me all the time. I say, oh, don't thank me. I'm just repaying a debt. This is, this is easy. And uh, I want to just make sure that you know you have the same, op same opportunity. And I want to just give you sincere thanks for being here to support the event. And I uh, ask that you continue to do so in the future. And thank you very much. I just want to recognize the Columbus Preparatory School for Boys, our mentoring program. If they would stand up, Mr. Owens is the principal. And, and last but not least, I just want to thank you and as well as thank um, my supervisor, Dr. Valerie Lee. Uh, June 30th is her, she's going to retire. She decided that it was better for her to spend time with her newly born grandchild than to hang out with us at Ohio State. She's paid our dues, and if you don't mind, let's please give her a round of applause. I've had outstanding supervisors. I went from Dr. Stewart, Dr. Lee, and I want to recognize uh, Professor Sharon Davies. She will be the new vice provost and put pressure on us so she'll continue to support us because the burden is on her now. But it, M Professor Davies, if you would stand up and so everyone will recognize. Thank you, Mr. Shoemate. I've been trying to get you for a long time. I appreciate you. Thank you, Gene Smith. Thank, send love to your wife. Thank you, donors, Fifth Third, Honda, uh, AP, and all of the different community community uh, organization, Bell family. Thank you for having Todd Bell and letting us to use his name in this beautiful honor. I wish you a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing you next year. And as they say at Ohio State, go Bucks.